Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you uh, at this, the time of the month of Rajab coming to an end. Uh, from here, the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network in my native island of Trinidad with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, wherever you are. And uh, you are viewing uh, this broadcast. Yes, it is the, the end of Rajab. We have just a few days left uh, before we greet the month of Shaban. Uh, and our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, used to make the dua in these months of Rajab and Shaban. He used to say, Allahumma barik lana fi Rajabin wa Shaban wa baligna Ramadan. O oh Allah, kindly grant us blessings in this month of Rajab and in the month of Shaban, which follows Rajab. And <coughs> grant that we might live to see Ramadan. And so we make this dua and we ask you to also make this dua. There are those who unfortunately were called away and would not live to see this Ramadan. And one of them was our brother uh, Molana Mushtaq Ahmad Suleimani. Um, he is a graduate of the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in uh, Pakistan, uh, the same institute where I studied when uh, Molana Dr. Wafi Muhammad studied and Molana uh, Siddiq Ahmad Nasir also studied at that institute. But, but we studied during the lifetime of our teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari. Uh, and our brother Mushtaq, uh, was, he came afterwards. We, we, we say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, because he passed away uh, in his native Pakistan uh, maybe about two weeks ago. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might have mercy on his soul and forgive him his sins. I used to meet him here at the IBN studio on Sunday mornings. He would be here when I complete my, my talk. Uh, this morning, I have a sad, another sad uh, uh, matter to mention to you, and that is that there is... Um, I'm making an appeal, but I'm making an appeal for someone who is very, very special. She is my student and she has suffered and suffered and suffered a lot. So I don't want this to become <laughs> a habit of people sending emails to me and asking me to make appeals for them. No, this case is very special. This is an Arab sister uh, who made a um, hijrah out of the Arab world, trying to find a place where she could live uh, uh, as a Muslim. She was being tormented, she was being persecuted. And after so many years of struggle and struggle and struggle, she's now in a very, 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 very uh, difficult situation. And uh, we need to help her. Uh, I cannot mention the details of her case, but I have, I have accepted, yes, I'm going to try to help you, sister. Um, we need to, to raise money to assist her with travel expenses to get out of the country where she is at this time. I don't want to mention the name of the country and the cost and so on, but I need to raise about 3,000 US dollars and there are those of you for whom 3,000 US is, is nothing, yes. And uh, if you can donate uh, to help this sister, uh, do please give me, send me an email. you find my email address at the bottom of the screen, ianhussein at hotmail.com. Send me an email, or if you're in Trinidad, you can give me a call. But if you're outside of Trinidad, you can send me an email. And then we can arrange, inshallah, for the money to be sent directly, not to me, but directly to the country where she is, so that perhaps within the next one week or two weeks, the sisters 
very, very dangerous situation now might be relieved. And she might be out of danger and she can go to a place of security. So I'm making an appeal for zakat. I'm making an appeal for sadaqah charity uh, uh, to the tune of about 3,000 uh, US dollars, inshallah. And if you can help, may Allah bless you. Another problem, and that is we <laughs> bookstore. And you'll see the bookstore at the bottom of the screen, uh, imranhussein.com, imranhussein.com. That's it at the bottom of the screen. And uh, some people now are behaving in a strange way. Uh, I have people running the bookstore. I have to pay them a salary. And uh, they're working for me, and they're taking a little bit of money from me, and you're overloading them with work because some of you are sending requests, making orders for books. And then when we contact you, you make no response. You're just silent. You're wasting our time. This seems to be, I fear, a deliberate, deliberate attack of provocation by the part of some people who are acting in a very strange, very strange way. So uh, may Allah forgive you for what you're doing. And please, 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 Stop doing that. If you, are, you want to order my books, then do please make a request. Go to my bookstore, imranhussein.com, and give your order, but you must do it bona fide. Okay? Uh, the next thing is that, uh, uh, yes, I have made the offer uh, because I need to have funds while I'm in Trinidad writing my books. So I, ordered, I offered to have a complete set of my books personally autographed by me. Uh, we, we, we were 28 books. One is out of print, we became 27. And now maybe two more, perhaps, uh, we're out of stock. So, so it's becoming less and less now. Uh, but we still have uh, maybe about 25, 25 or 26 books. Um, and uh, there's a new book also now being printed uh, in Malaysia, the Quran. Uh, the Quran, uh, the Jal, and the Jasad. So um, I made this offer that I would autograph the books provided that you make an order for a complete set. And yes, people have been making requests for the complete sets, and someone, I want you to autograph it for my son. I want you to autograph it for this one, for that one, and so on. It takes a long time for me to <laughs> autograph these books. For me to sit down for one hour, two hours autographing, I get a headache, but never mind. But what <laughs> I'm getting now is requests from people who want to order one book or two books, and they want those autographed. No, please. If you're ordering less than one complete set, please do it through my bookstore, and the books will be sent to you from either Malaysia or London, and I'm in Trinidad at this time. Um, so do please, I hope, you will just send orders for me only if you're ordering a complete set of books autographed by me. Then you send your request to me by email, ianhussein at hotmail.com. The next announcement, my website. We have been able to rebuild the website and you see the new website at the bottom. There you are, imranhussein.org slash n. Um, eventually, sometime, I don't know how long it will take, we'll go over to the old one and we we'll go back to imranhussein.org. But if you go to org slash n, you will be able to see the new website, newly revamped website, OK? Um, uh, a reminder very quickly because time is moving. Uh, the lecture in London on April the 27th, the launch of my book, Constantinople in the Quran. Um, this book, MashaAllah, was published exactly at the right time. Exactly at the right time. Because what happened in New Zealand has caused Constantinople to come back on the front burner. It's now a very important subject in the world. Uh, 
And uh, if you're in London, do please reach out to your Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters. There are about maybe 27 Orthodox Christian churches in, in London. Um, so there's a large Orthodox Christian community in London, and we would like them to come. Come and listen to this lecture and launch the launch of this book, Constantinople, in the Quran. So I'm asking you for your help if you're in London or if you're around in London. And then on the 28th, we go to Birmingham for the next lecture to prepare. How do we prepare for the Great War? This is the Quran, the Great War, and the West. There's a lot of sub material in the Quran concerning the Great War. Uh, but what we need to now focus on is how do we prepare for the Great War. Um, and then on the 3rd of May, again back in London, we'll have a lecture on the strategic importance of the fast of Ramadan. I have forgotten the name of the masjid now, but uh, you'll find all this information on my YouTube channel and on the new website imranhussein.org slash n. The news for you, if you are in uh, Malaysia, is uh, I had left Malaysia three years ago, uh, but I will be returning to Malaysia after Eid al-Fitr. You don't call it Eid al-Fitr, you call it Hari Raya. So we'll be lecturing uh, in Malaysia. There'll be at least three lectures, I believe, in Malaysia uh, around the middle of June. And then to Indonesia for one week. I want to go to Jambar where Sheikh, um, Sheikh, what's his name now? I can't remember his name. Uh, he has this great, great uh, um, complex in Jambal, and I've never visited it. And some lectures perhaps in Jakarta. And then the first week of July would be in Iran. If you are in Iran, you look forward. I hope I don't have to do too much traveling all over Iran. It's just one week. So maybe uh, Tehran and maybe Qom, maybe Mashhad, that's all. Um, the lecture for Mombasa is not as yet arranged. So if you're in Mombasa, please wait, be patient until we can arrange the lecture for Mombasa, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Kirk Megu, the political scientist uh, from is here at the uni University of the West Indies interviewed me uh, maybe a week ago and uh, the quality of the interview was very bad because it was done by internet with my laptop so it could not be, um, we could not be broadcast so what we're going to be doing now is to we're going to have a series of uh, interviews with Dr. Mego, um, and uh, they will be recorded here at IBN, um, one hour long each, and uh, they will then be broadcast on IBN, and then we'll put them on YouTube, inshallah. Those are going to be very interesting and very fascinating interviews because you have a political scientist dialoguing with an Islamic eschatologist. It has never happened before. Never happened before. This is the first time we're having this kind of dialogue. Uh, we're going to have to take a few minutes to the other problem. So don't go away. Bismillahi awwaluhu wa akhiru. We apologize for that break because of some audio problems here at the studio. Now then, in uh, our last uh, broadcast, we had commented on the the act of terrorism in New Zealand, where we were told that about 50 people were killed when this terrorist attacked uh, the masjid, two masjid in uh, New Zealand. It is for the Muslims of New Zealand to confirm to us that there were 50 funerals. We are not there, we are in Trinidad. So if there were 50 funerals, when well, we know that 50 died. If there were 3,000 funerals after 9-11, well, then we knew that there were 3,000 who died and who killed. And uh, we know well, how many were Jews and how many were Christian, but this is not allowed. This is not allowed. Don't ask questions about 
So now, because he published a manifesto before he launched the attack on the masjid, and in that manifesto there is a pride of place for Constantinople and for Hagia Sophia, we understood that the people who planned that attack, the masterminds who planned that attack, who brainwashed and trained this man to go and launch this attack, and who pre prepared that manifesto and which was published on the internet, we know that part of their plan was to try to get that attack on the masjid in New Zealand to provoke a response from Turkey so that millions would have come out on the streets of Turkey to force the hands of the Turkish government that you have to respond because this man is talking about Constantinople and this man is talking about Hagia Sophia, the Christian cathedral in Constantinople, which today has been renamed as the city of Istanbul. Uh, this Hagia Sophia, which is a Christian cathedral and which had functioned for more than 1,000 years as the foremost cathedral of the Christian world after Jerusalem, until the Ottoman uh, army conquered Constantinople in the year 1452, and then they took that cathedral and they converted it into a masjid. Then in 1924, when um, Mustafa Kemal took over control of uh, the Ottoman city of Constantinople, um, and it became now the Republic of Turkey, um, and he became the president of the new Republic of Turkey. Uh, then the Turkish government decided uh, sometime later to, pre to stop the use of Hagia Sophia as a masjid, not to return it as a church, which they ought to but to now designate it as a museum. <laughs> that is so funny. And uh, it has remained as a museum from that day to this day. But I believe that the purpose of that attack in New Zealand was to try to get, to force the hand of the Turkish government, I don't know if there was any collusion, to try to get Hagia Sophia reopened as a masjid. Yes, and it is this subject that we want to address this morning. Inshallah, let me first explain, and I hope that my Christian brothers and sisters are listening, because this is important information for you. The Islamic law First of all, from the Quran, we have a specialist in Islamic law sitting here with me in the studio this morning. Uh, Islamic law is derived, first of all, from the Quran as the primary source of law. And so, nothing in Islamic law can contradict the Quran. That's right. And what does the Quran say about Christian churches and Jewish synagogues and temples. And what does the Quran say? In Surah Al Hajj of the Quran, and maybe someone could take this information to the Turkish president, because obviously that man does not know the Quran or does not want to know the Quran. In Surah Al-Hajj of the Qur'an, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared. He says, and whenever we want to quote from the Qur'an, remember that the miraculous word of the Qur'an cannot be translated into any language. This is my opinion. You may, if you want, defer with me. 
But my opinion is that the miraculous word of the Quran cannot be translated. So I seek forgiveness from Allah for all the years of my life when I offered translations of the Quran and I said, this is the Quran translated. No, I seek forgiveness from that. And now I say only an explanation can be offered, not a translation. No. So this is what Allah has said in the Quran and therefore I have to give you what Allah has said. to suggest gently so that we should not avoid quoting the Quran in Arabic. No. Uh, there should be a love in our heart and a joy in our heart when we recite a verse of the Quran. We should do it lovingly. Hmm? That these are the actual words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we recite it, when we quote it in Arabic, it is recorded in our book. So this is what Allah has said. But whenever you want to quote from the Quran, the first time, you must always say, A'uzu billahi minashaytanir rajim, and then you quote. So we say, Ba'da'uzu billahi minashaytanir rajim. Walawla daf'ullahu nasa ba'dahum biba'd. If Allah had not, this is the explanation. If Allah had not caused some people to resist others, to stand up and resist them, to wage war if necessary in resisting their conduct. That churches and synagogues and temples and masajid, plural of masjid. I don't know what is a mosque. <laughs> and masajid would have been destroyed. So a Muslim, tell this to the Turkish president, please. A Muslim has an obligation, a religious obligation to fight, if necessary, to protect a Christian church, to protect a Christian cathedral. This is the Quran. The law of Islam cannot contradict the Qur'an because the law is derived from the Qur'an, first of all from the Qur'an. And so, instead of converting the cathedral to a masjid, what the Ottoman Sultan should have declared is this church, this cathedral will be eternally protected eternally protected because Allah has placed an obligation on us to protect the Christian cathedral. I want my Christian, Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters in Greece to hear this. If you are in the Balkans, I want you to hear this. If you are in Russia, I want you to hear this. This is the Quran. But obviously, the Turkish president either does not know the Quran Oh, he does not want to know it. So when in 19, sorry, in 1452, the Ottoman army conquered Constantinople, and the first thing that the Sultan Muhammad Fateh did, he may have done other things which were good, I don't know, and that's not the subject of my discussion. The Ottoman Empire may have done many things good, I don't know about all of them, but that's not the subject of our discussion, so don't bring any red herrings into the subject. No. We are concerned with this act, that the Ottoman Sultan, his name was Muhammad, and they gave him the title Fatih, Muhammad Fatih, the Sultan Muhammad Fatih, the first thing that he did when he entered Constantinople was to declare Hagia Sophia converted into a masjid, and we declared that this is something that violated Allah's command in the Quran, and therefore it must be condemned. Those of us who condemn it, we are on the right side of history. Those of us who refuse to condemn it, 
re, re, pre, prefer to remain in misguidance or in ignorance are on the wrong side of history. And so we are devoting time this morning to try to teach you your religion. We hope that our Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters in London are listening so you'll know the true face of Islam, the beautiful face of Islam, which in, in which a Muslim is ordered to fight <laughs> to protect your church and to pre protect the Jewish synagogue and the temple and the masjid. The first thing that the Ottoman Sultan did, therefore, in converting Hagia Sophia, the cathedral of Hagia Sophia, to a masjid, was shameful. It was disgraceful. It was manifestly sinful. If your enemy goes and takes a masjid and converts it into a church, does that give you the right to violate Allah's command in the Quran? Does the Quran ordain a law of reciprocity that you convert a masjid to a temple? I am allowed to take your, your church and convert it to a masjid? No. Slavery existed. When the religion came into this world, when it came with Moses, Nabi Musa, with Jesus, Nabi Isa, when that same religion of Islam came with Nabi Muhammad, slavery existed in the world. And it was in a state in which slavery already existed that the law of reciprocity was established, that if the enemy enslaves their prisoners of war, you are entitled to enslave your prisoners of war. But if the enemy desists from that, then you must desist from it. That subject is not connected with this. No. The Quran does not say that if the Christian takes a masjid and converts it into a, uh, into a church, you have the right to take Hagia Sophia and convert it into a masjid. No. And so what the Ottoman Sultan did, and I am speaking slowly, I know you've been brainwashed hundred years. So it's going to take an Imran Hussein to try to correct you now and teach you the religion. But we have to show patience with you. What the Ottoman Sultan did in taking Hagia Sophia and converting it into a masjid was a violation of Allah's command in the Quran. It was an act which was shameful, it was disgraceful, it was sinful. And it resulted in eternal shame and disgrace for the Ummah of Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, the, the, the followers of Prophet Muhammad. For us, we hang our heads in shame and disgrace. We've got to go back again for a break. We have all your problems. Bismillah rahman rahim Bismillah awwaluhu wa akhiru. We apologize for these breaks. Uh, we're having some audio difficulties uh, this morning. Uh, we just made the point that uh, when the Ottoman Sultan Muhammad Fatih converted Hagia Sophia, which is a Christian cathedral in Constantinople, which today is called Istanbul, in the year 1452, when they conquered the city, converted Hagia Sophia from a Christian cathedral to a masjid. We declare this to be something in violation of Allah's command in the Quran, explicit command in the Quran, where Allah had commanded Muslims to fight if necessary, to fight to protect the Christian cathedral. And you go and you convert the cathedral to a masjid. This was violation of Allah's command in the Quran. It was shameful. It was disgraceful. It was manifestly sinful. 
We also dispose of that bogus and spurious uh, counter-argument that the Islamic law permitted it. Islamic law is derived from the Quran, primarily from the Quran. So the Islamic law cannot be in conflict with the Quran. So that argument of yours is invalid. Please take it and put it away. It's invalid. But then we have something more to say, and we want our Orthodox Christian brothers and sisters to listen. Please listen, so that you can know what is Islam, not what was presented to you by the Ottoman, um, imperial Ottoman Empire, uh, but what is from the Quran. This is Islam from the Quran. If you never heard it for 600 years, well, let's, let's tell it to you. That the Quran says, when you are at war, that if the enemy wants peace, if the enemy is asking for peace, then Allah commands you to reciprocate, that you must also respond with peace. You cannot fight an enemy who is asking for peace. I hope the Turkish president is listening because it is manifestly clear that he either does not know the Quran or more dangerously, he doesn't want to know the Quran. Constantinople was a Christian city ordained by Allah. Allah ordained that it should become from a pagan city. It should become a Christian city. And you'll get the evidence in this book, Constantinople, in the Quran, which has just been published, Alhamdulillah. And we're going to launch this book in London on the 27th of April, inshallah. Allah has commanded that if the enemy wants peace, they do not want war, you must reciprocate. You cannot wage war on an enemy who wants peace. Constantinople was surrounded. It was marooned. The, uh, the, the uh, Christian emperor, the Byzantine emperor, had lost all his territories, and he was left with only the city. And the city was surrounded all around by, Ottoman, uh, by the Ottoman army. And he had only about eight or 9,000 men to defend the city. And around him is an Ottoman army which has besieged the city with 200,000 soldiers. And I'll have some more to tell you about those soldiers, that army. Tell me, <laughs> which, hot, which Byzantine emperor would want to wage war in such a situation? No. The Byzantine Orthodox Christian emperor wanted peace. If you did not hear that for 600 years, let me tell it to you now. Yes, he wanted peace. He did not want war. He was prepared to pay a tribute to the Ottoman Sultan for peace. And so it was haram. It was a violation of Allah's law in the Quran for the Ottoman army to continue to attack Constantinople when Constantinople wanted peace. Do you understand that? Those of you who are deaf, dumb, and blind cannot, cannot allow your, ha your head to submit to the Quran. The definition of a Muslim is that he submits to Allah. If you submit to Allah, you mean to submit to the Quran. And the Quran has prohibited you from fighting an enemy who is suing for peace. And so the conquest of Constantinople in 1452 by the Ottoman army was an invalid jihad. It was a bogus jihad. It was unjust, the violation of Allah's command in the Quran. And therefore, all, the, all the, the effects of that victory, all the things that followed, have no validity, validity in Islamic law. Uh, I hope that this message could reach the Turkish president, who either does not know the Quran or does not want 
to know it. After the uh, city was conquered in 1452, and uh, the cathedral was converted to a masjid, we have a new situation arising now. I have to cut out another part of my lecture this morning because we're running out of time. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, spoke about, he made a prophecy concerning an end time conquest of Constantinople. This is known as Ilmu Akhiri Zaman or eschatology, the study of the end time or the road map to the end of history. Hmm? I use this definition of eschatology in my interview with Dr. Kirk Mego, that eschatology offers a, a road map to the end of history, which incidentally reminds me that on Thursday, this coming Thursday, I have to give a lecture at the Institute of International Relations of the University of the West Indies, where I used to be a student many, many moons ago. And our topic is Islam, the Great War, and beyond. Uh, I don't think the, the room will be able to hold more than about 100 people. And the staff and students of the institute might take up about half of that. So if you want to attend the lecture, I am allowed to invite you. But you must contact me so I can send you an invitation to end, attend it. It's on Thursday, this coming Thursday, the 4th of uh, April, and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And the topic is uh, the Quran, the Great War, and beyond. So in this lecture, I'll also repeat my definition of eschatology, that branch of religious knowledge which offers a road map to the end of history. So our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about that road map to the end of history. And in that hadith, he spoke about the conquest of Constantinople. You have heard it from me many times already, but I will have to repeat it one more time. Yes. It's a hadith in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, and uh, this is what he said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. Excuse me. Umran Ubayt al Maqdis. Kharabu Yatrib. That when Baytul Maqdis, which is Jerusalem, when Jerusalem is Umran, it is built up, meaning this is construction terminology used, being used analogically. That when Jerusalem is center stage in the world, and the, the British, the American government just recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So Jerusalem is certainly moving to center stage now. When Jerusalem is center stage in the world, and Yatrib, Yatrib of course, is the name of the city north of Medina to which Nabi Muhammad migrated. It was subsequently uh, given a second name, Medina, but it's also, Yatrib is the name mentioned in the Quran. So Yatrib would be ruins, in ruins, meaning not that every building would be broken down, no, no. Meaning that Yatrib will play no role on the stage of history. Like Jerusalem is center stage and Yatrib is nowhere. When these two things are in place, which is where we are today, then, said the Prophet, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, the next event to occur would be the Great War. And that is my topic for my lecture in Birmingham uh, on the 28th of, uh, of April. I have lectured on this subject in Birmingham already, uh, but this time we're going to look to see how we prepare for that Great War. So do please come to join us in Birmingham. Kharabu Yatrib Khurujul Malhama. At that time, the Great War will emerge, meaning would take place. And we know a lot of things about that Great War. We know a lot of things about that Great War. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Rahman, for example, in Surah Al-Isra, for example, 
you, you also have it in the hadith, information concerning the great war. Khurujul Malhama. He then went on to say, Khurujul Malhama Fathul Constantinia. That after the great war, the next event to take place would be the conquest of Constantinople. Has the great war taken place as yet? <laughs> no. Only the deaf, the dumb, and the blind. Those who don't know and who do not want to know. Only they are the ones who say, yes, the great war has already taken place. Now, the great war has not as yet taken place. You have a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. It is also in Sahih Muslim. It is Muttafakun Alayhi. It is Mutawatir, that, that in that great war, 99% of combatants who are fighting on this side of the war will be killed, will be killed. We've never had such a war like that in history with 99% of combatants being killed. No, the great war has not as yet taken place. The great war is coming. It's coming because one side is lusting for war. And that is NATO. NATO, led by the United States of America, is lusting for their warmongering party. And the other side is an alliance of Russia with China. And I spoke on this in my interview with Dr. Mago. Please check out that interview on uh, my YouTube channel. And so the conquest of Constantinople prophesied by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has not as yet taken place. Is that so difficult to understand? Would someone kindly explain this to the Turkish president hmm? who is now preparing to reopen Hagia Sophia as a masjid <coughs> in violation of Allah's command in the Quran? Can he be recognized as a Muslim leader, eh? much less for a rightly guided Muslim? No. The conquest of Constantinople by the Ottoman Sultan Muhammad Fatih in 1452 did not fulfill the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Even a schoolboy should be able to recognize that. Well then, how come the whole Turkish nation and all the Muslims of the Balkans, illa masha Allah, how come they were all brainwashed for 600 years with this ton of rubbish? that the conquest of Constantinople in 1452 by the Ottoman army led by Sultan Muhammad Fatih fulfilled that prophecy. No, it did not. It is to still to come. And now we ask the question, why, why is there going to be a conquest of Constantinople? after the Great War. Who will conquer? Will it be the Christians or the Muslims? And what is the purpose? We have a little time left. Let's hope we can complete it. No, it's not a Christian army. A Christian army is not going to conquer Constantinople. So this is good news for you, my brothers and sisters who are Christians. You don't have to do it. If you attempt to do it, it's going to provoke war between the world of Islam and the world of Christianity. You don't want that. It's like Iran attempting to conquer Makkah, <laughs> take over Bahrain and moving towards Makkah. If Iran ever does such a stupid thing, such a stupid thing, it's going to provoke Sunni Shia civil war in the whole world of Islam. Yes, so don't, don't, don't ever do such a stupid thing. Rather, it is a Muslim army which will conquer Constantinople. So my Christian brothers and sisters, you can relax. We will do it for you. We will do it for you. Why do I use the word for you? The answer is because there is a reason why he prophesied that a Muslim army will conquer Constantinople. 
sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And he praised the army. لَتَفْتَهَنَّ الْكُنْسْتَنْتِنِيَ Said the Prophet You will most certainly conquer Constantinople. وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ And he praised the commander. And he praised the army. Why did he do it? Answer, because you misguided people are praising that army of 1452 and praising that commander of 1452. So he praised this army and this commander because this one represents the truth which has come from Allah and not that one which violated the truth which has come from Allah. Would you take these words to the Turkish president for me? Now then, why? Before we end. Why has he prophesied? What is the reason? What is the rationale? What are the implications of a conquest of Constantinople by a Muslim army after the great war which is around the corner? The great nuclear war which is coming. We don't know how many of us will die in that war. So while we have time, let us preach the truth. Our answer to the question, why a conquest of Constantinople in Akhir zaman Our answer to the question is, this is our viewpoint. And when we offer our view, we say, do not accept it unless you're convinced it is correct. This is our respect for your intellect, for your capacity to think. Because we, we invite you to think. So that on the basis of understanding and on the basis of of um, absorbing the meaning of a thing and being convinced of it, only then you accept it. That's the way we preach Islam. The reason why our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, has prophesied the conquest of Constantinople in Akhir zaman in the end time. And he's praised the army, and he's praised the commander. It's because when we conquer Constantinople, the first thing that we will do is to restore Hagia Sophia as a Christian cathedral. And you cannot stop us. Let me warn you. Let me give a warning to you. You cannot stop us. When we restore that cathedral to our Christian brothers and sisters, and when they listen to me, some of them even cry because the wound has been bleeding for 600 years. So there's joy in their hearts when they hear a senior Islamic scholar speaking like this. There's joy in their hearts, yes. We will restore that cathedral to you. When you come to London, you will hear me in person saying these words to you. You'll hear me, you'll see me. We will restore this cathedral to you and the Turkish government cannot prevent it and the Turkish prime minister, president cannot re re pre prevent it. No, because our prophet has prophesied it. And we'll offer an apology to you for what they did for 600 years. And more than that, when our prophet referred to Constantinople by the name Constantinople, Laftaftahannal Constantinia, it is sunnah for us to refer to that city by that name. So Mustafa Kamal, you can't stop us, no. We will return the city to the name of Constantinople and you cannot stop us. No. When we do that, I have just one minute now left. I wish I had more time. When we do that, then the prophesied, this is in the Quran and this is in the Sunnah, in the Hadith, there will be reconciliation between these two worlds, the world of Islam and the world of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity in particular. 
and there will be friendship and alliance between us as there is friendship and alliance now between Russia and China. The two greatest and most important developments in international relations in the world today are number one, the friendship and alliance between Russia and China, and number two, the emerging friendship and alliance between the Orthodox Christian world and the world of Islam, and praise is due to Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you.